I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Mark Lichtenfeld, Chief Income Strategist at the Oxford Club. Just a reminder before we get started that if you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Mark, thank you so much for being here online with me today. It's great to be with you, Charlotte. Yeah, great to be catching up with you. And as we usually do when we have these conversations, I'm going to start off with a couple of questions on gold. We just wrapped up the second quarter a couple of weeks ago. And although the price did rise during that period, gold ultimately ended fairly flat compared to where it started. So first question for you, what do you see as gold's price drivers over, over the Q2 period? You know, it's it's so hard to tell what is going on with gold. You know, if, if you look back, let's say 10 years ago and told a gold investor that over the next 10 years, uh, the U.S. government and, and governments around the world are going to be, you know, running their printing presses nonstop. And that, oh, by the way, 10 years from now, there's going to be a global pandemic that's going to kill millions and completely shut down the global economy the US government will be literally handing out trillions of dollars for free, you probably back up the truck and buy as much gold as possible because gold should be at record highs and yet it's not. Uh, gold really hasn't done too much despite those things. So it's, it's really difficult. I wish I had a, an answer for you, um, but there just seems to be a disconnect between what are kind of the traditional gold fundamentals and what's happening out in the world. And, and, and oh, by the way, one other thing, to add to that is, is inflation is, is finally starting to, to pop up, yet, yet gold really isn't responding to that either. So it's, it's really difficult to try to figure out what is happening with gold and why gold isn't at record highs. Yeah, and certainly that's that's a sentiment that I hear from many of the people that I talk to. There's this confusion with all of these factors that should be good to, for gold. Why is it not at a higher price? We'll come back to inflation, but maybe before we go there, looking at the broader market beyond gold, what have you been noticing in Q2? Any trends that you've been looking at? Well, I mean, you know, other than uh, the occasional big price decline, uh, you know, that lasts a, a day or two. Uh, the market's still in a, in a broad uptrend, and uh, there's kind of no reason to think it's it's going to stop. You know, for for a while we had interest rates starting to move higher, and then they plunge. Um, so uh, keeping keeping investors in stocks and, and making stocks really the only place to go. So um, for the immediate future, I, I don't I don't see anything changing unless we mm -hmm. do see some kind of uh, you know, dramatic event, uh, you know, out in, out in the world, like, like we saw with COVID or, or something like that. But even then, that was only a short term uh, correction or, or short term bear market before things just got got going again and went right back to record highs. So as long as interest rates stay low, I, I'm not sure what will change the, the overall stock market. Yeah, and we had one of those blips in the market on Monday of this week. We're talking right now on Wednesday. It's July 21st. What do you make of those those movements? You mentioned we've seen them before. There was one then. How are you seeing that? Uh, you know, just just a, a drop in the in the pond, so to speak. You know, those things happen routinely in bull markets. It's not the first. It's not the last. There was some. Some people blaming that the, the Delta variant of COVID uh, was really picking up steam and responsible for a lot of the illness in the world um, in regards to COVID and, and, and increase in cases. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really difficult to say what causes a one day movement, especially when it, it bounces so quickly. I mean, we saw on Tuesday, it bounced hard. And, uh, and again, on Wednesday, making up uh, you know, most of those losses, if not all of them. So, when that happens, you know, you, you try not to, you try not to give it more credit than it probably deserves. Yeah, and this goes back to the piece of advice that you left us with last time when we spoke about three months ago, which was, you know, to think about the market in the long term versus the short term. Right. Are there any other distractions, short term things that you see people getting drawn off track by and maybe making changes to their portfolios that they should just leave for the time being? Well, it's it's you know that's a really good question because sure we could see 
if if COVID really does start to pick up again, people start getting sicker. If, if the Delta variant now apparently there's a um, I think it's a Lambda variant coming out of South America that is is supposed to be uh, very contagious as well. So COVID is is a big wild card. Uh, who knows what will happen there? Um, on the other hand, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm bullish on the stock market. I don't see a reason for it to change, but it's getting very expensive. It's frothy. There are a lot of people out there who who think it'll never go back down. It'll never correct. It'll never be another bear market. And uh, you know, you've got some stocks just trading at outrageous valuations, and and earnings are going to be very strong this quarter and and likely next quarter compared to last year. So that might fuel those high valuations as well. So I'm just a little concerned that the market is getting frothy and that could lead to a correction. Um, but again, I, I would suspect that any correction would be short term and, and be a, um, a buying opportunity. Right, and let's go back to inflation and try to tie that together with what we're speaking about. I remember again, the last time we spoke, you were saying that you thought it would be bigger than most people were anticipating. What have you seen since then? Do you see more mainstream knowledge of what's going on in the market? What are you seeing with inflation? Absolutely. So, I mean, just the consumer price index for June was up 5.4%, the most in years and years. Um, but, you know, if you talk to anybody who's actually in business, not just the, the economists, they'll tell you that their costs, you know, all their raw materials, uh, costs have skyrocketed. I just was having lunch today with a real estate developer. So talking about plywood for building and, you know, materials for roofs and, and everything, his costs have skyrocketed. Uh, a good friend of mine is a food wholesaler. Uh, some of his prices have tripled in things like oils uh, and meats. So, you know, anybody who's, who's in business uh, knows that the prices are just going absolutely crazy in certain areas. And I think that's going to eventually be reflected in consumer prices even more so. And, and, and I'm, I'm very concerned, especially with the Fed's stance that kind of there's nothing to see here, everything will be fine. We're gonna keep interest rates though. I, I, I'm concerned that inflation is gonna get, get out of control. And, uh, you know, again, I, I don't wanna scare people and think that I'm talking about Zimbabwe type inflation, uh, where, you know, you, you take your, your paycheck in cash and in a wheelbarrow to the bakery. But I, I do think that we could get much hotter inflation than anybody has seen in this country in, in several decades. Right. And maybe let's talk about what the Fed stance on inflation is right now. Jerome Powell has consistently described it as transitory and, like you said, acting like there's nothing to see here. I did see this week that Joe Biden was commenting on challenges associated with inflation, indicating that maybe there's some concern there. So do you think we'll see any changes in the near term future from the Fed and its approach to what's going on? Probably not, but it, it I think it will depend on the data. If, if the July numbers and August numbers come out, uh, you know, very, very strong, especially if it's, if it's higher than the 5.4% figure we saw in June, I think they're going to have to at least acknowledge it. And even if they don't make an active policy decision at that point, I, I think they may have to at least put it on the radar that rates could be headed higher. And then that actually could be a catalyst for the stock market uh, correcting. Uh, so I, th I think it's certainly worth paying attention to, but I, I don't think that, 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 Powell and the Fed can just stick their head in the sand if the numbers continue to go higher, as I think they will. Right. And we've talked in the past about kind of inflation proofing a portfolio. One thing that we went over is value stocks as opposed to growth stocks. So I thought maybe we could return to that and have you explain the difference between the two for those who might not be aware. And for you, when you're identifying a value stock, what are the criteria that you are looking for there? Sure. So a growth stock is a company that is growing their sales, growing their uh, earnings and cash flow, uh, usually pretty rapidly. They're usually funning, funneling all of their uh, free cash flow back into the business to, in order to grow it some more, whether that means you know, hiring more, more staff, acquiring other companies, et cetera. A value company is typically a little bit more of a mature company. 
Um, they may still be growing, but they have generated enough cash at this point that they're not kind of in that rapid growth mode. And very often, not always, but very often return some of that cash to shareholders, either in the form of dividends, which is what I prefer, or in the form of stock buybacks. Uh, and then they're also typically a much lower valuation because the market loves growth. So they'll typically pay a higher premium, uh, higher valuations for growth stocks. Uh, value stocks that are growing a little bit slower are, are I don't wanna say shunned, but are, are, are not embraced as much as growth stocks. So their valuations tend to be lower and you can, you can get a better deal. So you know, the, in, in, a, in a white hot bull market, typically growth stocks are the way to go. And, and those premiums uh, on the valuations will typically increase and grow as earnings grow. Um, when things are flat or, or heading south, value stocks are, are often a better way because the valuations are, are low enough that there's often a floor below those stock prices where let's say a stock that's trading at 40 or 50 times earnings, if they miss their, their earnings expectations, they could take that stock down pretty far um, in price, whereas a value stock, let's say it's trading at 14 times earnings and the market uh, doesn't look so hot, 14 times earnings is, is a pretty low valuation and, and theoretically uh, it shouldn't go that much lower. You know, and again, every stock is different, every sector is different, but the basic idea is, is you're buying a stock cheap, so it shouldn't have a whole lot further to fall if the market falls. Right. And so when you're looking at them, where are you seeing opportunities right now in the value stocks? Are there any names that you could mention for us? Sure. So I think a lot of the industrial metals miners are really interesting trading at low valuations. So uh, companies like Southern Copper, um, Rio Tinto, I think are, are really interesting. Um, I also like some of the financials. Uh, you know, Most of the financial companies, banks, uh, insurance companies especially, uh, they really depend on interest rates. The higher the interest rates and, and the wider the spread, usually between short-term and long-term interest rates, the more money they make with interest rates going back down towards record lows, uh, it's tough for them to make money. So the ones that are profitable, the ones that are well-run, those companies are, are trading at really bargain basement valuations. And when interest rates eventually increase and, and whether that's next year or three, five years from now, who knows, but once they do, their profits should really, really explode. And if you can get in now at a really low valuation and some of them paying really uh, decent dividend yields, then uh, you know three years, five years from now, if you're a long-term investor, you could do exceptionally well. Right, and of course, let's talk about dividend stocks as well, which we know that you're a big fan of. Is there a way that dividend stocks typically perform during an inflationary environment or a way that their dividends may move during that time? So it, it really depends on the kind of stock and the sector that you're invested in. So one of the things that I focus on are dividend growth stocks, and that those are companies that are growing their dividends every single year. And the reason for that is basically just for times like these, for when inflation starts to pick up, so you're generating more income every year and hopefully keeping up with and beating inflation. So over, over the last 10 years when we've had you know, very, very low inflation, having, having a dividend growth stock has certainly been nice and it's been great to you know, get a six, eight, 10% boost to your dividend income every year. Who doesn't want that? But I don't know if people have, have found that to be of the utmost importance, kind of a nice to have versus a must have. I think if, if we do, enter a period where inflation is rising five, six, eight, maybe even 10% a year, that's gonna be critical to make sure your investments are not only paying you income, but growing that income every year so that you're not losing your buying power year after year. So that's really what I focus on are, are finding those companies that, are, that have the cash flows to support raising their dividends every year. And, and I think in this period particularly, you're gonna want companies who will be able to either pass on increased costs to their customers, so that'll grow their cash flow, or, uh, or you know, take advantage of high, things like higher interest rates. Right, and of course, I need to ask if there are any top performers in terms of dividends that you could mention for either Q2 or if you want to look back to the full first half of 2021. 
Um, so some of the top performers, uh, you know, Texas Instruments has been a fantastic company for many, many years. Uh, you know, what, what we've, what I've seen is, is some of the companies in tech actually, because tech has, has been such a strong performer for a while now. So some of the kind of the old tech companies that pay dividends. So, you know, they're the more mature companies. So things like um, Broadcom, Texas Instruments, those kinds of companies did really, really well, continue to pay their dividends, continue to raise their dividends, but the stock price appreciation has been very strong as well. All right, I think that wraps up all my questions for today. You've left us with a lot of good information. I do wanna ask before you go, if you have any final advice for investors and maybe you could give us an idea of where to find you if people wanna learn more from you. Sure, so you can always uh, visit wealthyretirement.com. It's, uh, it's our free website and we publish uh, information every day on the markets. Um, as far as what to do you know, going forward, it, it's kind of you know what, I, what I'm always preaching is you want to be invested for the long term. If you're if you're a short term trader and you you know like to scalp trades, fine, you know go for it. I, I have no problem with that. But if you're a long term investor, you know try not to get too concerned about those big down days like we had on Monday, where the Dow dropped uh, 700 points and at one point was down over 900. Uh, you know if, if it's something that is, I'm not saying that you automatically buy that dip that afternoon. Um, although, you know, short term, uh, as of Wednesday afternoon, that would have been the right move. But um, I'm not saying that you always do that, but you don't want to get too concerned, too freaked out about even drastic moves in the market, uh, because it happens, happens all the time. It's happened in every bull market we've had over the decades. So the time to get concerned is, I think, when there is a, a shift fundamentally. So whether that is that interest rates are going higher, whether there is some kind of uh, black swan event like COVID. Um, you know, at that point, I think that's when you may not, you know, buy the dip as, as soon as it happens. You could you could wait a little bit and, and see what happens, keep some powder dry, which is always a good idea as well. So, you know, the basic message is don't panic just when we have a nasty sell-off where as of right now, we're still in, a, in an extended bull market. All right. Well, I know how hard it can be to stay calm in some of those circumstances. So thank you for that advice. And thank you for coming on to talk about what's going on in the markets. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is Mark Lichtenfeld with the Oxford Club.